Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Located in the heart of Bloomsbury, just moments away from University College London and the British Museum, Russell Square is one of London's largest squares, and one of its leafiest too. Russell Square can also lay claim to some intriguing historical connections, which amongst many other things, include links with the RMS Titanic, and the development of the atomic bomb. And in this video, I'd like to share those stories with you. So, let's take a walk around then, and see what we come across. You may be wondering where the Russell name comes from. Well, the square is named after the Russell family, who, thanks to some close connections with Henry VIII and Edward VI, have held the peerage title Duke of Bedford since the 1500s, and it's for this reason that you'll find the Bedford Way, Bedford Place, and Bedford Square close to Russell Square too. Along with this swanky lordship, the Russells also happen to own the land which Russell Square, along with the rest of Bloomsbury, is built upon, a portfolio which is no doubt worth a few quid. In centuries past, the area now occupied by the square was mostly open land. It was first mentioned in the Doomsday Book, described as being a fertile place, complete with vineyards believe it or not, and, quote, a wood for 100 pigs. Over time, the land dwindled to become a rough patch of ground known as both Longfields and Southampton Fields, which in the 1700s was described as a place of unruly behaviour where swarms of loose, idle and disorderly people assemble to play cricket, tossing up, etc, which usually terminates in broils and is the cause of various kinds of mischief. Towards the southern part of this open space, there was some civilization though. For just north of Bloomsbury Square, there stood a grand mansion called Southampton House, which was built by Lord Southampton in the 1630s. The Russells obtained this property a few decades later, and when they did, it was renamed Bedford House, in honour of their title. When Francis Russell, the 5th Duke of Bedford, inherited this lovely place in 1771 though, he decided that he wanted nothing to do with it, preferring instead to live much closer to the glamour of the West End. Consequently, he auctioned off the entire contents of Bedford House, and once that was done, he had the building demolished. Quite a travesty I think you'd agree, especially considering Samuel Pepys once described the manor house as being a very great and noble work. Once Bedford House had been wiped off the face of London, Francis commissioned the era's most noted developer, James Burton, to curate Russell Square and its surrounding streets, along which a number of fancy homes were built. The large gardens at the centre of the square, meanwhile, were designed by the celebrated landscaper, Humphrey Repton, who many regarded to be the successor to Capability Brown. Aimed at the city's wealthier folk, the properties around the estate soon became popular with those working in the legal profession, primarily because the houses were a short walk away from the Inns of Court. And as such, in its earliest days, Russell Square was known as Judgeland, a nickname which I reckon sounds a little ominous. What do you think? Francis Russell, meanwhile, began spending more and more time in the countryside at Twyburn Abbey in Bedfordshire, which was, and still is, the seat of the Russell family. Here he occupied himself by establishing a farm and breeding cattle, sheep and racehorses, and as you can probably guess, that's why there's a Woburn Square and Woburn Place close to Russell Square too. Although when it was initially laid out, Woburn Place was called the Duke of Bedford's New Road. Russell Square was completed in 1804, although sadly Francis would never get to see it finished. He died in 1802, aged just 36. You can see a statue of him on the south side of Russell Square though, which has stood here since 1809. And if you look closely, you'll see that the memorial contains elements related to his love of agriculture, including lambs, horses, bulls and a plough.
Since the early 20th century, the eastern side of Russell Square has been dominated by two huge hotels, the Hotel Russell and the Imperial, each of which have their own intriguing connections with certain historic world events. The Hotel Russell, known today as the Kimpton Fitzroy, is the oldest of the pair, having been designed and built in the late 1890s. Its architect was Charles Fitzroy Doll, who, as you can see, spared no expense when it came to blessing the project with luxurious detail. Indeed, it's through his extreme attention to ornate bits and bobs that the phrase, all dolled up, is said to have originated from. Inspired by the Chateau Madrid, which had once stood on the outskirts of Paris, the hotel's beautiful soft brown brickwork has been dubbed tea au lait, tea with milk, amongst which you'll find an array of cherubs and grotesques, alongside famous historical figures. The main entrance, for example, is dominated by four queens, Elizabeth I, Mary I, Mary II, and Anne I. Whilst around the corner on Guildford Street, you can see busts of several former British Prime Ministers, including the Victorian heavy hitters, Gladstone and Disraeli. During the first few decades of its life, the Hotel Russell was also topped with a large glass dome, although sadly this was destroyed during the Blitz. Inside, the hotel was equally lavish. It was the first in London to offer ensuite bathrooms after all, and it's within these plush surroundings that's too eerie albeit beautiful connections with the Titanic can be found. The first is this stunning restaurant, which is known today as the Galvin Bar and Grill. Not long after creating this eatery, Charles Dole was commissioned by the White Star Line to design the first class dining room for their upcoming Olympic class ship. Seeing how well the Russell Hotel's version had been received, Charles Dole based the Titanic's restaurant upon this design meaning the two were almost identical in appearance. Smaller, but no less poignant, the second link with the Titanic can be found in the form of this bronze statue of a dragon, which is perched a few flights up on the hotel's gorgeous marble staircase. Rather chillingly, an exact copy of this statue was also installed aboard the Titanic. A twin which now of course lurks deep beneath the waves of the North Atlantic. In the wake of the Titanic disaster, this little dragon came to be nicknamed Lucky George, in reference to the fact that he wasn't the one to have pitched a ride on the doomed liner back in April 1912. A few doors up from the Kimpton Fitzroy is its sister establishment, the Imperial Hotel, which being designed in a brutalist sawtooth style stands in stark contrast to its gothic Victorian counterpart. Originally though, the Imperial was very similar in appearance to the Russell. This is what it used to look like, an equally ornate establishment which was also designed by Charles Fitzroy Dole. However, in what was arguably one of London's greatest crimes against architecture, this incredible building was demolished in the 1960s, and the incarnation of the Imperial we see today was built later that same decade. The old Imperial Hotel was famed for its subterranean Turkish baths, and it's through them that a number of old echoes can still be seen. These statues, which are now displayed in the modern hotel's courtyard, once stood amongst the steaming baths. Whilst a short distance away, on the corner of Russell Square and Guildford Street, and outside what's now a branch of pret a manger you can see this old ghost sign pointing the way to the now long-lost facility. One fellow who happened to be very fond of the Imperial Hotel's Turkish baths was a brilliant Hungarian scientist named Leo Szilard. Born in Budapest in 1898, Leo served in the Austro-Hungarian army during the First World War, after which he moved to Berlin to study engineering and physics. However, when Hitler rose to power in 1933, Leo, being Jewish, recognised the danger immediately 
and so decamped to London, where he initially made the Imperial Hotel his home, largely due to the fact that they had the Turkish baths. For as Leo himself once said, there's no place as good to think as a bathtub. As a physicist, Leo followed the developments in atomic science very closely, and so, when he picked up a copy of the Times in the lobby of the Imperial Hotel on the morning of the 12th of September 1933, he was quick to spot an article reporting on a conference which had been held the day before, in which the potential for harnessing nuclear energy had been debated. In the piece, it was reported that Lord Ernest Rutherford had stated any such notion was a very poor and inefficient way of producing energy, and that anyone who looked for a source of power in the transformation of atoms was talking moonshine. Leo heartily disagreed with this dismissive attitude, and so, deciding to mull the idea over, headed out for a walk. After exiting the Imperial Hotel, Leo paused at this exact spot, the junction where Russell Square meets Southampton Row. And as he waited for the traffic lights to change, he had a eureka moment, an idea which, not being a nuclear scientist myself, it's hard to do justice to here, although in layman's terms, what Leo suddenly envisioned, as he stood on Russell Square, was the means required to achieve a chain reaction, the process which, when controlled, gives us nuclear energy, and uncontrolled, a nuclear blast. The historian Richard Rhodes would later describe Leo's light bulb moment in suitably dramatic terms. The stoplight changed to green, Sislard stepped off the curb. As he crossed the street, time cracked open before him, and he saw a way to the future death into the world, and all our woes, the shape of things to come. Indeed, Leo was cursed with anxiety from the moment he had this spark of inspiration, for he was well aware that such knowledge could, and would, pave the way for developing weapons of horrific magnitude. As a result, he initially kept the thought to himself, although as time wore on and the Second World War erupted, he grew concerned that the Nazis may be attempting to develop atomic weapons, which they indeed were, under the tutelage of the German quantum mechanics expert, Werner Heisenberg. Leo's fears led him to write a letter to President Roosevelt, which was backed and signed by Albert Einstein, and which, to cut a long story short, eventually resulted in the establishment of the Manhattan Project, in which the United States successfully built the world's first atomic weapons. Like his fellow atomic scientist, Robert Oppenheimer, Leo Sislard remained forever haunted by the role he'd played in casting a nuclear shadow over the world. Despite working on the Manhattan Project, he was fiercely opposed to unleashing atomic bombs on Japanese cities, and as the Cold War developed, Leo argued strongly against any further development of nuclear weapons, an argument which, as we now know, went unheeded. As this display in Russell Square Garden shows, there have been many notable people associated with the square over the years. Let's go and see who's who. Some former residents are marked with plaques. Sir George Williams, for example, the fellow who founded the YMCA. Lillian Lindsay, the first woman to qualify as a dentist in Britain. And Richard Dawley Cart, the theatre impresario who founded the Savoy Hotel. A particularly sad monument is this one at number 21, which is dedicated to Sir Samuel Romley, a law reformer who played a key role in abolishing the brutal penalty of being hung, drawn and quartered, the last instance of which was conducted as late as 1782. As well as that, Samuel also campaigned for the end of the slave trade. Tragedy struck the Romleys on the 29th of October 1818, when Samuel's wife Anne passed away. Stricken with grief, Samuel then proceeded to take his own life just two days later in this very home, leaving an incomplete note which simply read, My dear, I wish. On a lighter note, a plaque for the poet T.S. Eliot can be found on the northwest corner of Russell Square, marking his place of work back when the building was occupied by the publishers Faber and Faber. 
Opposite to that is one of London's most unusual plaques, one that, rather than commemorating a person, offers an apology. The plaque in question was installed in 1995 by the University of London, the building being their Brunei Gallery, which forms part of the School of Oriental and African Studies. When this building was being planned in the 1990s, documents related to its construction were sent to the Russell family, as being on their estate, they were the ones who gave the final go-ahead for any such project. However, the Russells never signed the plans off, meaning this building, technically, didn't receive permission. The university puts this plaque in place as a means of saying sorry, and as the gallery remains today, I guess the Russells weren't too fussed. Other folk associated with Russell Square include the suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst, who lived as number eight, William Nobby Clark, a code breaker who was born on Russell Square in 1883 and who would go on to play a vital role in establishing Bletchley Park, and Oscar Wilde, who on the 19th of May 1897 spent his last ever night in London on Russell Square. The following morning he travelled to Paris and would never again return to Britain. Another figure marked in Russell Square is the folk musician Ewan McCall, who penned hundreds of songs throughout his long career. One of which, Sweet Thames Flow Softly, surely ranks as one of the most beautiful London themed tunes ever written. Ewan is remembered in the gardens with both a tree, which was planted in 1990, a few months after his death, and a bench, which was placed here in 2022. It's worth noting that Ewan's daughter, the singer Kirsty McCall, who was killed in a horrific boat accident in Mexico in December 2000, is also commemorated with a bench in London. You'll find Kirsty's not too far away, in Soho Square. Back at Russell Square, there is another memorial tree which we really should take a respectful moment to consider for it was planted here in memory of the 56 people who were killed in the July 7th bombings in 2005, a terrorist outrage which Russell Square will forever be associated with due to the proximity of two of the explosions, one on the tube and the other on nearby Tavistock Square. Arguably the most characterful building on Russell Square is this little green hut, which serves as a cafe for London taxi drivers. I'm hoping to cover London's green cabman shelters, which have offered cabbies a place to rest and have a meal since the 19th century, in a separate video at some point, so I won't go on too much about it for now. I will say though that this example dates from 1901, and was originally located in Leicester Square. It was relocated to Russell Square in 1987. Another piece of cab related infrastructure can be found close to Russell Square on the junction of Colonnade and Herdbrand Street, just behind the Kimpton Fitzroy Hotel. This is the old horse hospital, which in the days when cabs and other vehicles were horse drawn, cared for many a sickly London cab horse. The building is now an art space. By the way, if we return to the Russell Square shelter for just a moment, it's worth pointing out that, although only licensed cabbies are allowed to eat inside, the public are more than welcome to order food and drink as a takeaway from the serving hatch. Give it a go, their prices are some of the best in the city. Another food option in Russell Square is this cafe, which has been run by the Italian Tropier family since 1981. They even have some custom made chess tables outside. If you fancy a game, just ask them for the pieces. If you're familiar with the London Underground, then you'll know that Russell Square has its own tube station, which is tucked just behind the Kimpton Fitzroy Hotel on Bernard Street. Built by the Great Northern, Piccadilly and Brompton Railway, simply known today of course as the Piccadilly Line, Russell Square Station opened on the 15th of December 1906, and is designed in a lovely old oxblood red tiling style, which was devised by the genius architect, Leslie Green. In 1907, when the station was still pretty much brand new, an extraordinary incident occurred here when, just before midnight on the 15th of June, a fellow named Eddie Gurin was shot outside. Eddie, who survived the wound, 
was a known criminal with a very murky background. At the time he was shot, he was in fact a fugitive, having escaped from the notorious French penal colony known as Devil's Island, which is off of the coast of French Guiana, and the place people today may know best as the setting for the 1973 Steve McQueen film, Papillion. The man who shot Eddie was an American, a Kansas City resident called Charles Smith, who carried out the crime in partnership with another American, his lover who went by the very gangster sounding nickname, Chicago May. Eddie had once been Chicago May's lover too. They'd committed a bank robbery in Paris together, and when he was caught and shipped off to Devil's Island, he became convinced that it was Chicago May who'd framed him. Consequently, after making his audacious escape, in which he used a makeshift canoe, he made it all the way back to London, where he threatened May with revenge. A threat to which May and Charles responded to by taking action first, culminating in the shooting outside Russell Square tube station. Charles and May were both handed long life sentences for attempted murder, whilst Eddie, despite being given a second chance at life, continued in his criminal ways. The last record of him comes from 1933, when, then aged 72, he was caught snatching a woman's handbag in Ealing, a crime for which he was promptly sent to prison. Some people just never learn, do they? Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look around Russell Square and would love to hear your own thoughts on this famous London address. Is it a place you're familiar with? Have you ever dined in the Russell Hotel? And who is your favourite historical figure associated with the square? Please do be sure to let me know in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you who support my channel with your kind words, likes and shares. I couldn't do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it would be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching, friends. Stay well, and please be sure to stay tuned.